The lecture today, of course, this is picking off the costumes. It is going to be given presented by <coughs> Professor Alexandra Bond. She is one of the most special and almost rare, in a sense, in, in, uh, scholars and costume designers. Because you see, uh, as Chinese people talk about operas a lot, they talk about the stories a lot. While actually they make a lot of fancy, very expressive costumes with fabric and design. So they're all very fancy, but in the whole world, there are very few people who really can analyze these wonderfully constructed costumes, how they help the performers perform with their roles, whether it be empress or hero or, or young lady or playful maid. So, but those are totally integrated with the Chinese performing arts, the body, the storyline. And very few people can analyze this in a good academic way and in an artistic way. So you need to be a good scholar. You need to be also a creative and artistic designer. And in Professor Alexander Bond, we have both. So she is a, not only a very uh, decorated professor at the University of Oregon, she is also a very famous design, costume designer for not only Chinese kind of thing, but also European operatic theatrical works. And her designs, have been displayed in Europe, Prague, Beijing, so so. You cannot have a more fascinating, uh, authoritative people than Professor Bonds to introduce picking up her costumes. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank Joseph Lamb for inviting me here to share my research with you. I'd also like to thank David Ralston, who was a reader on my manuscript and helped me to write a much better book um, because of the input he provided. Um, so um, you might wonder how I became interested in costumes of the uh, Beijing Opera. In uh, the academic year 1990-91, my husband and I were given Fulbright appointments to teach at the, what was then called the National Institute for the Arts in Taipei, Taiwan. And as soon as we arrived, we started going to the performances that they had there. And I was instantly attracted to these amazing clothes that I was seeing on stage. And I inquired of one of our colleagues at the uh, theater department where we were teaching about the costumes. And she said, well, the goal of the costumes of the Chinese opera is to identify the roles for the audience. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? That's what I do in my job, is to project what the character is to the audience. And so I wondered what techniques they use in the Chinese opera in order to do that. And um, so I, I came at it from a complete outsider. I needed to learn as much as I could about Chinese theater and then learn about imperial dress and then gradually learn about the costumes of um, the Beijing opera in order to um, create this book that I have written, which is no longer available, but um, <laughs> here is a copy of it. Um, and I'm sorry it's not available. We're trying to fix that. Uh, so I think we need to start with a little bit of background on this form of theater. There are over 300 kinds of indigenous forms of theater in China that combine music, dance, voice, and sometimes um, acrobatics. And Beijing opera is one of these, and it's considered to be the nationally dominant style. Um, it was established in the 18th century. Um, there's a wonderful story about um, the Qianlong Emperor um, during the Qing Dynasty. Um, he reigned from 1736 until 1796, and he was a great admirer of theater performance. We love it when our government officials like the arts. Um, so when his 80th birthday was celebrated in 1790, the best of the performing companies from all of the nearby provinces came to Beijing, and they sort of cross-pollinated, and the best of the best came together, and this is the very briefest version of this story, formed a new kind of performance that was based in Beijing and so therefore called the Beijing style. And then this date in 1790 is not only celebrated for being the emperor's birthday, but also considered by some to be the birth of the Beijing opera style. Now we need to go back even farther in time and talk about ancient China. 
Um, and so we have this picture of uh, beauties with flowery hairpins to look at. Ancient China was known as the land of impeccable attire. And I've always hoped and dreamed that maybe someday the United States would be known as the <laughs> land of impeccable attire, um, but I don't know if we'll make it. Uh, but, um, you know, we can always hope. I think I'm getting feedback. What do I do to avoid that? Uh, I can hear it. I think you can hear it too. Uh, so anyway, in the 5,000 year history of the country, the Chinese people believed that personal clothing and adornment were di indicative of being cultured and civilized. Yes, thank you very much. Um, dress was used to identify people, and it was an outward expression of one's place in society. And so clothing differentiations in terms of the color and the ornamentation that you have on would distinguish your rank and your status and your position visually. Um, through these um, things that had cultural significance. So it's only natural that if you have a traditional theater evolving from this cultural context where clothing is a way of communicating who people are, that this theater form would absorb that same kind of language and use clothing for the identity of their characters. And as many of the stories are about <coughs> historical characters, the costumes therefore reflect the visual and historical context of the imperial court. So that meant that I needed to go back and learn everything I could about imperial dress before I could start learning about um, the costumes. In that process, I read a book by Schuyler Kamen, who was a researcher of imperial dress. And he wrote um, a book called China's Dragon Robes in 1952. And I will quote Mr. Kamen, who said, before 19, it's still feedback, isn't it? It's okay for you? Yeah. I'm the only one hearing it? Okay, I'll deal. Um, before 1950 in China, once Chinese friends invariably said, if you are interested in Chinese costume, you must often go to the Chinese theater. Such advice is worse than useless. <laughs> As China has no tradition of theatrical research, both actors and their managers lack any true conception of what the costumes and furniture and weapons were like at the earlier periods. Anachronisms are countless and often very ridiculous, even in plays about the last dynasty. Apologies to Mr. Kamen, he was not a costume designer, okay? And so what he didn't realize was that we always take what is historical and we interpret it and we adapt it in order to tell the story that we want to tell on stage. And so that, was what I figured out immediately was that we, these historical troops were manipulating dress to make it stage worthy. And um, tradition, though the traditional Chinese opera costumes to um, the, the lay person might appear to be trying to replicate imperial dress, in fact what they're doing is creating this whole new style to appear on stage. And theater, um, the two forms are really quite distinct for several different reasons, both historical and practical. The first is that theater emerged from ritual dances and where period authenticity was not even an issue. You know, they were just doing things that would look nice on stage. The second thing is that in the Ming Dynasty between 16, I'm sorry, 1368 and 1644, there were actually regulations established prohibiting actors from wearing certain garments. Actors were always considered to be the lowest form of society, and so they could not wear these emblems that would have been on uh, the imperial clothing because that would have been an insult to the emperor. And um, be, they had not earned the right to be able to wear these things. Another reason is that performances were staged outside without any lights. And so everything on the costumes had to be bigger than it is on the imperial dress so that the audience members would be able to see these things from a great distance. So from ancient times in China, We've got this attire that has significance to distinguish one's position in society and at court. Traditional theater evolves from this very rank and clothing conscious society and logically absorbs a similar design language for the identity of the characters, but also they bring in this idea of theatrical invention. 
Now, what I am sorry to say is that this invention was not done by costume designers. <laughs> it was done by the actors <laughs> and the theater managers. I get really upset when an actor wants to do their own costume, you know, but, but that is the tradition that they have there. Okay, so now we need to bring in another aspect of this. The stories that they use in the performances of the Beijing Opera are drawn from the riches of historic literature and folk tales from this 5,000 years of history. Therefore, attempting to designate every dynasty and every <laughs> ethnic group over this 5,000 years would just drive any costume designer mad, and they didn't have costume designers even. So instead of trying to incorporate these external factors of time and place and season, they focus instead on defining the roles specifically through the symbolism of the color of the costume, the shape of the costume, and the surface decoration. So these are basic elements of design, and you're going to hear those coming back repeatedly, and there will be a test on that part at the end. <laughs> um, theatrical performers, their dressers and their managers, are the ones who developed this unique blend of historical and theatrical imagery that's suitable to portray ancient China across its lengthy history and vast regions. And then, as I said, time and place um, are just this single conventionalized style that's worn for every performance. So every troupe, and this part I kind of think is, is terrific, every troupe has trunks or wardrobe cabinets, and they assemble a set of costumes that has enough pieces in it that they can have what every character in every play needs just by going and pulling these same costumes. And when they need a new one, they write up a, a request and it gets sent to the embroiderers and they sit there for a month and they make a beautiful new costume um, for them. But w by, by doing it this way, we always have this beautiful unified picture and the Beijing Opera aficionados, and there are, I hope, still plenty of them still around, the people that like to go to every performance of every play, will instantly know when somebody comes on stage who they are because of this set of conventionalized costumes. So let's talk about how these things appear on stage. Uh, the first thing is the absence of time period, as I said. All plays, regardless of their time period, are presented with the same selection of costumes. And anachronisms occur both within and among the costumes because of that. So here, the woman on the left, if you've seen the Last Emperor or you know some movie about um, the Qing Dynasty. Um, I'm sorry. I I I I, I mixed up my sides. Um, the 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 woman in red <laughs> is in the Qing Dynasty style, which goes. Uh, um, have I got that right now? Ming yeah. Dynasty. No. no. Help me out. Qing Dynasty. Qing Dynasty. Qing Dynasty. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, the one in red is in the Qing dynasty style, the last dynasty, and the one in right is in the Ming dynasty style. And yet here they are standing side by side. Um, and, but there's a reason why they are like that, which I will explain to you later. All right. The next thing is the absence of place. And um, although the stories in traditional Beijing opera take place in a variety of locations throughout history, the costumes don't reflect the individual regions of every ethnic group because there are too many ethnic groups to do, to do that with. The only distinction that is made in this regard is that the majority Han people in the play are dressed in the Han style costumes resembling the Ming dynasty and then everybody else is dressed in the Qing dynasty garments, okay? And I asked my teachers, I said, wouldn't the Qing dynasty emperors be upset that all foreigners are dressed in their clothes? I mean, is that politically correct? Mm -hmm. And my teacher replied that they had more important things to think about than, <laughs> than political correctness in the costumes. So, um, so again, we have these two women in two different costumes standing next to each other because they are representing different ethnic groups, not because they are representing different time periods. Okay? But the different ethnic groups came from different time periods, and I'll get to that a little bit later. The third thing that's missing in Beijing opera costume is any indication of the season. Okay? Now, during the Qing dynasty, 
the members of the court had winter and summer versions of their clothes. And the emperor would actually choose a day and say, this is when everybody's going to switch. And there were clothing police who would go out and give you a ticket if you didn't change. Well, maybe not, but something like that. <laughs> if, if you didn't change, then, then it, was, it, it was noticed. And I was in Beijing in the spring one time, and I was there on that day. It was freezing cold one day, and then the next day it was in the 70s. And I thought, oh, the emperor must have decided this is the day when we're <laughs> supposed to change our clothes. Um, so we never see any indication of temperature on stage either. And this is all really particularly fascinating to a career costume designer because when we go into a production meeting, which is our first meeting to get together with all of the artists involved with the play and the director, the first three things that we usually ask are, what's our time period, where are we located, and what time of year is it? Because that has a real strong impact on the clothes that we choose for um, the play. Okay, so now we've got this set of costumes that is conventionalized or standardized. And what that means is that the same um, character appearing in different performances by different troops can look virtually the same. So here we've got the same play. Um, it's a phoenix returns to its nest, and we have the same character. This is the father of the phoenix, the young lady. And here he is on stage in the Beijing troupe, and here he is in the national troupe. And I think you can see that the color of the costume is similar. It's not exactly the same, but they're both in that olive green range, and both of them have roundels of embroidery. They're not in exactly the same place, but they're close. And the roundels have a, a combination of floral and um, geometric embroidery. The beard's the same, the hat's the same. So that's what I am um, indicating about when the audience goes to see these. This guy walks on stage. They know that this is the father. And they also know by his clothing that he is mature, that he's married, and that he's dignified. I'll tell you a little bit more how they get that far um, later on. OK, so then the next thing that we see is these are the same role type which means they are a similar kind of character, but they're in different plays. So these are two different actors from the same troupe. Um, or it may actually be, it might be this, no, it's two different actors in this example. Two different actors in the same troupe. They are wearing the identical costume pieces, and they are playing the same kind of woman, but in two different plays. So there's a lot of um, similarity and repetition. And so this visual convention is what enables the audience to be able to identify them. Now, I added this one in because I saw somewhere online that you had used this one in your publicity. And so I thought, oh, I better include this one. Um, and this is about. Uh, when you have conventionalized costumes, it means that your actors become really familiar with the clothing that they're wearing. And they're really good at moving in these um, specific pieces. And they use the clothing as part of their expression of character. So on the left hand side, you see these white extensions on their sleeves. These are called water sleeves. And if someone is upset, they can fling their water sleeve. Or if they have to drink tea, they can use their water sleeve to cover their mouths because it would be very indelicate to have an open mouth um, exposed to somebody else. Um, then over here, uh, a lot of the headdresses have these wonderful six foot long pheasant feathers on them. And when they're fighting, they will move their heads so that they fly around. This guy was a little bit angry. And so he grabbed his feathers and put them crossed over in his mouth and kind of uh, growled at the audience. And then when he was done with his speech, he opened his mouth and the feathers went uh, back up again. And it was, it was very impressive. You, you can't do that unless you wear these costumes all the time and know how to, to operate them. Now, I've used this term role type. And I've tried to kind of gloss over it so that you wouldn't worry about it too much. But now we need to get serious and explain what role type means. There are four major role types, as we see here. And for those of you who do know um, China, Chinese, I put the pinyin down here for you. But I'm not going to um, use that in my presentation. And these role types are characters who have similar characteristics but don't have to be exactly the same. And every character in every play is assigned to some kind of role type. 
and then within the role type there are subdivisions for the character's age and the actor's performance skills and some of them focus more on singing and some of them focus more on acrobatics and each role type can be recognized again by their hair their makeup and their clothes in this ideal visual image that is the same across performances. So now let's look at the male roles. Um, on the far side, we have the mature male roles. These are scholars and statesmen, and they are often the principal characters. That's usually the guy that the story is about. They are loyal and deserving of respect. They wear long robes, they have long beards, their robes are often maroon or olive green. These are colors for mature characters. Um, and they frequently have that round pattern that I showed you before on the father. And we see the round um, dragon on this fellow's uh, uh, robe as well. And they have a skin-toned makeup. In the center, we have our young gentleman. They are unmarried, but generally interested in love. Um, and they are the scholars, the princes, and the dandies. And so if they're in a story, quite frequently they have come a courting um, to some, some beautiful young lady. They wear what's called an informal robe. And yes, we'll go back another layer and look at these gar garments um, a little bit later on with embroidered flowers on them. Now, if you look at his face, you can see that his skin is a paler tone and he has a red mark between his brows here. It's an arc of rouge that says young man. And you'll also notice that the young man doesn't have a beard. This is another way of being able to tell his age. Then our last figure is the martial um, gentleman, and they wear armor, fabulous version of armor. And he's got a skin-toned face with an arrow shape between his brows. And his um, f specialty is going to be more on movement, whereas the other two are going to be um, more focused on uh, vocalization and singing. Uh, we have four different female roles. The first two are on this slide. The mature women are the revered grandmothers, um, mothers, and dowagers. And they wear very little makeup. They have gray to white colored hair that's often wrapped in a scarf, as we see here. Their robes are knee length, but they have the roundels. And so if you have a man and a woman who are married, they're going to be wearing the same color, either maroon or olive green, with matching roundels on their costumes. And then under their robe, they have a pleated skirt that's often a green or um, a blue color. The uh, young ladies that we see here um, are the filial daughters and faithful wives. They have a pale face with cherry blossom brush, blush from the eyebrows to the cheeks and they have a formal robe that they're wearing that also comes to the knee length with a skirt underneath it. Um, and then they often have flowers instead of the roundels because of their youth. Okay, the second two ladies are here. Um, the one on the far side is the flower woman um, and that's how it translates. Um, these are flirtatious, lighthearted, and humorous uh, roles. And their clothing is much less dignified. You can see that she's got on a short jacket, so it doesn't have that elegant line um, that we see in the older women. And so that shows, to some extent, their lower status. But their makeup is absolutely beautiful, and their hairstyle is the same um, as uh, the older women. Then the warrior women, um, as we see on the other side here, are the valiant fighters. And she's dressed in full armor. She's got flags in the back and streamers and fringed edges so that when she spins around and does her um, choreographed battle, she's going to look larger than life and be quite um, wonderful and um, exaggerated. And, and obviously, her skill is going to be in um, the, uh, the martial arts and the acrobatics. The third role type is uh, the painted faces. And this might be what you've seen. Um, this role type seems to be what ends up on a lot of the posters because it is the most um, distinctive and most exaggerated. And um, the painted face role is for men of great strength and formidable physical and mental powers. These guys are um, uh, the ones that are really strong. Fierce warriors, upright judges, evil bandits, and supernatural beings all fit into this category. And the extreme patterns on their facial designs express their character as if they are wearing their personality on their faces. 
There are different facial patterns for all of the characters in this role type, and there are over 700 of them. And so again, if you are really good at your, your Beijing opera attendance, you'll be able to recognize them when they come on stage based on the pattern that they have on their face. Um, these guys also wear thick-soled boots, uh, as you can see there, and they shave their heads so that they have this larger canvas to paint the makeup on, and they wear big shoulder pads so that they are truly larger than life when they come on stage. And they generally wear court robes that have these large twisted dragons on them rather than the sedate circles that we see on the mature men. The clowns are the last of our four major role categories, and they are, as it sounds, they are the comic relief. Um, we've got three different kinds of clowns here. The first would be the civil clowns, and these are the civil officials who are corrupt or foolish. Now, just a little side note here. An emperor can be played by a mature man, if that is the kind of guy he is. He can be played by a young man if he's younger, and if he's not a very good emperor, he could, in fact, be played by a clown. Um, we won't draw any parallels right now, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, um, the civil clowns um, are corrupt or foolish, and they have this white block of paint that's on their face, and that sometimes leads them to be called tofu face, because that's, that's what it looks like. And notice how it diminishes their features, whereas the painted face guys want their faces to be larger, these guys are smaller. You can see his shoes there. He just has a flat little sole on his shoe, so he's not doing anything that, to make him look uh, large and imposing. Um, the martial warriors in the center here are very clever, wily fighters, and these are the ones who are real masters at the acrobatics. Um, and they wear something simple, just a jacket and trousers, so that they have maximum movement capabilities. Um, the last one that we're looking at would be the comic women roles. Um, and you, you, it would not be proper to have a real actor, could be male or female, who's trained in doing beautiful young women to play this comic young woman role. And so they assign those roles to the, the clowns to do these roles. And their makeup, it's kind of hard to tell here, but it's sort of a smudgy version of the beautiful makeup that the young women wear. And then quite frequently, the robes that they wear are colors that are a little bit unattractive. This, I think, is not the case here. That one is pretty nice. So now, let's go back and look at the four costumes. And um, the four major costumes would be the court robe, the formal robe, the armor, and the informal robe. And that's the order in which they are considered. Um, that's their hierarchical order, and so the order of importance. If so what we're using is this limited variety of form or cut of costume that reflects a small range of the garments that are found in daily life. And then for both history and on stage, the variety comes in making these costumes in different colors and putting different embroidery on them to make them different. But we keep this similarity that helps to create that, that sort of standardized look on stage. Now we're going to have a little bit of a history lesson. Um, this is one of my favorite parts. I like to think that I'm the one who discovered this. Um, but you know, who knows if I'm the first one who saw it. Um, on the far upper corner, um, we have a Ming Dynasty robe, and the Ming Dynasty was the last of the Han dynasties, the Han being the major um, ethnic group in China. And we, uh, you, you can kind of tell that it has wide sleeves, and it's got this trapezoidal shaped skirt. And so it's a large square shaped garment. Then on the other side, this, this would have been designed for long, elegant, slow movement of um, the Ming Dynasty court. Then the Manchus came in in 1644 and took over, and they had a completely different nomadic lifestyle. They lived on horseback, and so their robes are designed for riding horses. They're slashed in the center front and back. They have these cuffs that you can put down over your hands so you don't get cold when you're riding on planes. Um, and the other thing that they did was to, to standardize this pattern of ornamentation on the robes so that it has waves on the bottom, and mountains here, and then dragons, 
in this cosmic landscape. And all of those little things that we're seeing around that, those are clouds. So it's the universe that we are seeing in the emperor's robe. So now, if you take the shape of the Ming Dynasty robe and the ornamentation that's on the Qing Dynasty robe, this is what you end up with. So it's this fabulous blend of the two so that you can use it for any emperor throughout history. And this is what it looks like when it's on stage. The guy on the far side is wearing the kind that has the small round dragons on it because he's our dignified um, mature male. And then our painted face character has large writhing dragons. Can you see how it goes up over one sleeve and then across the chest? It's always covered up by their incredible beards. And, um, but when they turn, turn around, you can see the, the pattern a little bit better on the back. Both of these styles of dragons were adapted from historical dress. Um, they were, in fact, in Mr. Kamen's book on imperial robes. Um, so anyway, uh, the women's court robe has no historical precedent. Um, this was just something that was purely invented for the purpose of stage so that when the women were at court, they had something to wear that um, looked appropriate for them. And so this is for high-ranking women at court. There's one style for older women that is straight and it's olive green. And then our younger women wear something that is much almost frillier because it's got this wavy edge on it. And instead of having dragons, it's embroidered with phoenixes. And this costume would be for princesses or concubines. And um, uh, in legend, the dragon representing the emperor um, and the phoenix, which we see on the concubines and princesses, the dragon and the phoenix were considered to be lovers. And that's how the women end up having the phoenixes on their gowns. Now here's another um, historical example. Um, it's a Han dynasty, uh, I'm sorry, Han style robe that goes back as early as the Song dynasty. That's one that I found. And then um, also in the Ming dynasty. And it's just a fairly straight robe with a closing down the center front worn over a pleated skirt. And so here, this is what we see um, on stage on the far side, a woman with that same kind of robe open down the center front worn with a pleated skirt. And um, this is considered to be formal day wear because it opens down the center front and is therefore symmetrical. The informal robe closes to the side, and so it's not considered to be as high a ranking a garment. Um, the robe is worn by both men and women. The women wear the shorter version with a skirt underneath, and then the gentlemen wear a version that goes down to um, the ankles. Also, another difference is that the young ladies have sprigs of flowers embroidered on their robes, and the gentlemen have these uh, circles on them um, because th that was a, a, an older guy, even though he didn't have a beard. <laughs> Sometimes they, they do that. OK, armor. Chinese armor was really fabulous. You may have seen some of those um, wonderful ceramic forms that have the multicolored glaze dribbled on them, and these guys with segmented pieces of armor um, and that's quite decorated. Um, the Qing Dynasty armor, um, I'm sorry, the Ming Dynasty over on the other side um, has all of these segmented pieces and layers and flaps, which do translate to stage. And then the Qing Dynasty armor has this gold embroidery on it and, and, and metallic studs. And so these sort of come together to form what we see on stage. But really, this is so utterly theatrical. <laughs> You know, this, and, and it's really quite wonderful when they move in it. They have these flags behind them that wave, and there are streamers on top of the flags, and fringe, and the feathers. And I've actually seen people turn somersaults when they're wearing this stuff. They are really quite amazing with what they can do. The male armor has metallic embroidery most of the time with gold dragons and scales. The female armor would have. Um, phoenixes and flowers and multicolored. And so we do see that distinction between the two. The last of our garments would be um, the informal robe with the asymmetrical closing. You can see it closing in both directions here, um, but the one on the far side is, is generally the direction that they close. And oh, by the way, they don't switch back and forth from male and female. Everybody wears theirs closed on the same side. So here is that 
informal robe. Now, one of the things that I found really intriguing is the informal robe is the lowest ranking robe or garment, but it is the most widely used. It can be worn by everybody. And so emperors can wear this if they're in an informal situation. Um, young scholars wear it. It's kind of a uniform for the young scholars. And then the grandmothers, the poor grandmothers, also wear it. But it just depends on what color it is and what kind of embroidery it has. So she is wearing this rice-colored one that shows that she's hungry. But he has this beautiful blue one with flowers on it that shows that he is a scholar and a dandy. OK, now we've got one more piece of the puzzle to put together here, and that is the color. Um, now, it may appear as though these vibrant colors are random and unrestrained, yet there is a very strong system of color that they use in order to express the characters. Um, and um, there are five upper colors that we see here and five lower colors. And generally, the upper colors appear more often in court and battle scenes, whereas the lower colors are more likely to appear in the domestic scenes. But it's not exclusive. They can go back and forth. The upper colors that we're looking at here, red, green, yellow, white, and black, correspond with the five points of, I'm sorry, the four points of the compass plus the center, the five points of the compass in the Chinese universe. And yellow is the color that's in the middle, and that's how yellow has come to be the color that represents the emperor. So the red would be used by characters um, worthy of respect who have honor and loyalty and um, essentially good characters. Green is for high-ranking characters um, and often indicates a military function, such as a general. Yellow is reserved exclusively for the emperor and for members of the emperor's family. Um, now, just an interesting note, I've told you about the trunks or the cabinets where these garments are stored. The, the yellow court robes are always stored third down. They don't want to put them on the top because they don't want them to get a swelled head. So uh, a little personification there, anthropomorphization. Um, white um, is for men who have grace, charm, and are um, loyal to their country. And then black is for characters who are straightforward, brave, honest, and upright, um, such as the example we see here, Judge Bao, who is known for his just decisions. So now we move to the lower colors. There are some variables in the lower colors because they are blended. And um, so they don't always look exactly the same in every costume. That's how we end up with that olive green that is a little bit of a vari uh, variation. But they are generally listed as purple, which looks like maroon to us. And so I call it maroon. Otherwise, people get confused. Um, pink, blue, which is a sort of royal blue, and then lake blue, sky blue, or turquoise for us, and then bronze or olive green at the end. Maroon is used for upper ranks in the court, but also, as I mentioned before, for mature characters who wear that. And generally, they are noble and forgiving. Pink is for youth. Um, and if a young man wears it, it indicates that he is handsome and romantically inclined. Um, blue, uh, this color blue, is for um, high status and does appear in the court. It's worn by virtuous characters who are calm and firm and could also have a military connection. Um, and then lake blue, um, as we're seeing here, is specifically for our youths. And it can be on either a man or a woman to show their youth. Um, and for a gentleman, it shows that he is scholarly and elegant. And then the fifth of our lower colors translates variously as, and I've seen all of these, olive green, bronze, gray, brown, beige, copper. But they all pretty much are, have the same um, reason. They represent um, the elderly characters. OK, on the surface, there are three different ways of modifying the surface of um, a fabric in China. 
The first one that I have here would be tapestry, which is a very complex form of weaving involving expensive equipment and well-trained well weavers. So this obviously is not going to be used in the costumes. But if you go to a museum quite frequently, if you'll see imperial garments there, they are um, uh, tapestry weave. The one in the middle is painted. And of all of the 60-some performances that I saw, I only once saw this painted costume. And I wasn't going to take a picture of it because I was so upset by it. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I need this for an example. So I did, did get a picture of it. Um, initially, all of the costumes were painted because the troops were poor. And painting costumes is really cheap. Anybody can do that. Um, but gradually, they figured out that anyone with a needle and thread could also learn how to do embroidery, even young, young girls. And so that is the tradition that continues in um, the Beijing Opera, that their costumes are embroidered. And they are embroidered with a silk thread in the areas of color. And then the gold that we see would be a piece of thread that has gold wrapped around it. And then it's put on top of the fabric and then stitched in place. That's called couching. And um, some of them are solid couching. Um, we're seeing quite a bit of it down here at the bottom. The kinds of embroidered images I've already told you, but now we'll focus on it a little bit more, would be dragons for anything to do with the court on the court robes and flowers for the domestic dramas. And um, an interesting point that I found was that in these um, clothes that you would wear at home, we see flowers on both men and women, whereas in imperial history, men would not wear a flowered gown. So this is something that has appeared specifically for the stage. Let's take a look at the makeup and the headdresses. Um, uh, as I've mentioned before, the young ladies have a whiter skin tone with the red that goes from the brow down to the cheek, whereas the mature women have a more natural skin tone. Then our young ladies could wear this first one is actually you know, 20 or more individual hairpins that have been stuck into her wig, which is the way that the um, uh, Han women would have worn their hair style. Um, then the next one has on a phoenix crown, which is a, a solid piece. And all of those pearls are on springs, mm -hmm. so that when she moves, you get this wonderful sense of, of twinkling and, and alive uh, movement. Um, I've never met a director who would allow me to do that. But um, The next one, the, the warrior has on a helmet, and all of those little pom-poms, the puffballs, are on springs. So that when she starts doing her acrobatics, that stuff all moves as well. And then our mature woman just has a scarf around her head. She, she loses out. Um, OK, then young men have similar um, headdresses. The first one is a crown with the articulated pearls. The second one is a helmet, and he's got the articulated pom-poms. The third one is a hat. It's a solid piece. And of course, it's black on black, so you can hardly see it. But I think you can see the pieces that are coming out behind of it. And this is um, a hat that's worn specifically for court. And then there are a lot of fabric caps that are just soft. And, and that's quite frequently what we see on um, the young men, a beautiful embroidered fabric cap that matches um, the informal robe that they are wearing. OK? Um, then the clown makeup, as I said before, they have that tofu block on their face if they are civilian. If they're military, they have a smaller um, bit on, of white on, the, on their face. But they always have something there. There's actually a character whose name translates as Lou the Rat. And he has a rat on his face. Um, so. The, uh, their faces are all different in the same way that the painted face patterns are all different as well. The delineations in the painted face categories vary. There are somewhere between, I would say, 9 and 14. It depends on which book you read. I settled on about 11 of them. Um, and each, it, these are categories that all of the painted faces fit into. They seem to like having um, that kind of a structure. Um, with almost all of the painted faces, they wear beards. And so the lower part of their makeup is obscured by these beautiful, thick, woolly beards that hook over their ears very obviously. They are not intended 
to be natural or believable. So the first one is the whole face, and that means that it's a solid color. Um, and that is used for characters with integrity and virtue, although this one that some of you might recognize is really quite deceitful. Um, then uh, the next one is the 60% face, where the face is divided approximately one-third, two-thirds in color. And this indicates characters of age who are faithful. The lower part of the face can be lighter um, into a pink range as the character gets older. This one in the middle is called a three-tiled face. And they figure those tiles are the forehead and the two cheeks. So they've got this area. And that is what determines the color of the face, is what um, color is in that area. And that is a pretty wide-ranging one used for um, a lot of characters. So it doesn't have a specific meaning so much. This is the 10 face. Those of you who know Chinese, I think there are plenty of you in the room, know that 10 is that. Um, uh, character, and that's what we're seeing on the face is this cross shape here. Um, and this is for men who are cruel. Sorry. Um, the ingot face here on his forehead, this is the shape of um, Chinese money that used to have that um, shape to it. And so this is for characters, characters who are often wealthy, but also considered to be stupid. Um, it took me a long time to see a show with somebody with an asymmetrical face. And I was so excited that I finally got one. By the way, I took all of these pictures in a theater using a flash camera, and nobody cares. <laughs> but I'm so glad, <laughs> because um, it enabled me to have all these beautiful illustrations in my book. Um, so anyway, this was a very minor character, and it was only on stage for a very short time. But the asymmetrical face is for characters who are flawed and devious. And so it, it shows that in their face. Um, this is considered to be a scattered pattern, where it's not conforming to the shape of the face. It kind of conceals the eyes and nose and features. Um, and that would be for characters who are rough and uncouth. Um, the last one is the monk which is worn by monks. Um, and they have a whole face that can be white or pink or red, as we see here. Red would mean that this is a, a martial monk. And their design is distinguished by having a red dot on the forehead um, that represents a pearl. The last three, then, are pictured here. Um, eunuch faces are distinguished by heavy black, bow black brows and downturned mouths. And the eunuchs don't wear beards. OK. Um, animal faces um, are created with a pictogram of the animal. Um, I would think that many of you would be familiar with the Monkey King with this very distinctive facial pattern that he has. Just an interesting side note, um, every school of training or even you know, if an actor becomes so famous that they have their own acolytes, will have their own versions of each of these patterns. So within the over 700 patterns, there are patterns among patterns. And each person, when they put it on their face, puts it on in such a way that it conforms to their um, physiognomy, their, their uh, bone and, and muscle structure. So there still is quite a bit of leeway in this. Um, the last one that we're looking at is um, a god or spirit face. And it's, a, it's a, a little bit blurry, but I think you can see that there are two faces on one face. And this is the god of the giant spirit. And the one above is a laughing baby. And the one below is the old man. So, OK, so now we're ready for our test. Remember that our goal of the costumes is to identify the character for the audience. So there are six pairs of um, words or dyads that they want the costumes to be able to identify. And remember that I gave you three elements of design, form, color, and pattern or texture that we're looking at. So I've got my elements of design down here, and I've got my identity up at the top. Primary <laughs> is identifying which characters are male and which characters are female. Okay. So form, one way that we can tell the difference would be that the women wear short robes and the men wear long robes. And the ladies have on skirts and the men don't. Over here, we've got a fighter 
who has on trousers. Here we have a female fighter who's wearing a split skirt on top of that. So, you know, she can still fight in it, but nonetheless, she's got um, a skirt on. And then the difference in pattern, at least between these two, the fellow has on a geometric pattern, and Our Lady has on the multicolored flowers. So we are distinguishing them that way. Okay. Another thing that we want to be able to identify is youth and age. So in the far picture we have, this is actually the phoenix and her mom. The phoenix is in a beautiful lavender colored robe. The mom is in olive. And then our young scholar is in the sky blue robe. And the, the other father is in um, the olive. So color certainly tells us about the character. Another thing that we can see is that the older men almost always wear the formal robe and the younger men almost always wear the informal robe. So that is how we get the form on there. And then the last one is pattern with the young people wearing the sprigs of flowers and the old people wearing the geometric patterns. Okay. Our next one is upper and lower status. So certainly someone has on armor covered in gold, that's going to give them high status. And then I put the two ladies side by side to remind you how we tell the difference between the dignified young ladies and the flower women who are servants and, and sort of best friends. So the length of the robe gives us a difference there. Our last character is um, a servant. And this is one of the few examples I found that was not made out of silk. This is a cotton robe. Yay, how about that? So fabric is one other way of telling us um, about our different characters. Okay, our next category is um, rich and poor. Notice that rich and poor is not the same as status because quite frequently our stories are about people who had status and have uh, lost their money, so they, they are now poor. Um, and so the two are considered to be separate. Our princess is the first one, and she's wearing a court robe with her phoenix crown, pearls, embroidery, all of these indications of her wealth. The woman in the middle, though, is a formerly wealthy woman who has fallen on hard times. And the robe that she is wearing is called the wealth and nobility robe, even though it's black covered with patches. Now mind you, it's made out of silk and covered with silk patches. Mm -hmm. So she, she, you know, she still is beautiful, but nonetheless she has fallen on hard times. And the name of this robe carries with it a wish that wealth will return and that eventually um, she will get back to her former status as well as um, wealth. Our last one is um, a young man who has fallen on hard times, and he has what I think is a really elegant informal robe, but it does not have as much embroidery on it as the other one did, and it's black. A young man wouldn't wear black. They would have their pastel colors. Okay, and then another one here would be um, military and civilian difference, and that's pretty obvious. Our military man is in armor, our civilian is in the formal robe. So both the, the form as well as the embroidery that's on it, the pattern, are distinguishing them. And then our um, last category is that identity between the Han and the minority. So on the far side, we have someone in the Han style dress, as I described before, with the short robe and skirt, and then the headdress that's made out of all of the pins. And the woman on the right then has on uh, the Manchu style dress with the high headdress and the full length robe. The gentleman in the middle is wearing a hybrid costume. The robe that he has underneath is in fact the same shape as that um, uh, Manchu robe that I showed you with the horseshoe cuffs and it's slashed in the front and back. But then the jacket that he's wearing over it is a Han style. And so this is actually somebody who is going in both directions. Um, Silong, for those of you who know, um, Silong going to visit his mother. Um, and so he's halfway in between. Okay, so now we can bring all of this together and look at these fabulous um, both male and female warriors for you. Um, as, as I started, we've got this cultural context that really admires textiles and adornment 
and this idea of being able to identify people by the clothes that they wear. And so the Beijing Opera Place, I think, can easily compete with the grandeur of the courts and the textile arts, exemplifying the pinnacle of what we would see in stage costume. They are not replicating the court, but rather creating this whole new world that is equally spectacular. The visual image for every actor is carefully created to embody the idea of Chinese cultural life and expression. Um, in a very theatrical context. So I hope that you will have an opportunity soon um, to witness these costumes on stage and the performers live and that you can be a part of the audience that is invited into this world where the visual language and uh, of the clothes plays an equal part with the spoken word in identifying the characters and the stories that are being portrayed on stage. And I'm really glad to hear about the country performance coming because they share many of the same characteristics. You won't see the battle costumes in Kunshu, but you will see the, the formal and informal clothes and a lot of the same principles um, in the performance that will be coming on Valentine's Day. So remember me when you go to see that. <laughs> Thank you.